Hi everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us today for our webinar, Leveraging Social Determinants of Health is Easier Than You Think. We'll examine innovative approaches for incorporating information on social determinants of health into population health data sets. We will have a raffle at the end of the presentation for a $250 gift card, so make sure you stick around. You do have to be present when the raffle takes place to win. My name is Kathy Susich. I'm Director of Healthcare Marketing at Dimensional Insight, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. I'm joined by two of my colleagues. George Dealey is Dimensional Insight's Vice President of Healthcare Solutions. He has a master's degree in computer science and professional certifications from HIMSS and CHIME. Marissa Leone is healthcare product manager and front end developer for the healthcare applications development team here at Dimensional Insight. She has her bachelor's of science in nursing and her master's of science in health informatics. Her master's thesis was titled Technology Necessary for Population Health and detailed how technology can help providers better manage their populations and improve health outcomes. If you have any questions during our webinar, please feel free to type them in the questions box. We will be taking questions at the end. So first, uh, let's start with why this topic is important. Marissa. Yes, uh, so um, the social determinants refer to the physical and social circumstances that impact the person's well-being such as employment, income, housing, and access to transportation. It's become increasingly clear that these factors have an even greater impact on a person's health than the information that's routinely collected in a healthcare setting. In fact, a statistic that's often cited is that social determinants account for 80% of an individual's health, but information collected in the healthcare setting only accounts for 20% of health status. Right, and healthcare providers are, are beginning to screen for social factors in care settings, and formal vocabulary such as the uh, ICD-10 code set for diagnoses are beginning to include designation, designations for social determinants, but frankly, it's, it's early days. And even with, with that, we won't have visibility into segments of the population that don't interact with the healthcare system to begin with. So the current reality is that there's really just not enough information on specific individuals to provide much help in measuring and improving the health of population. But given the importance and the potential of social determinants, we should probably at least try to integrate what's available into our, approach, into our approaches for population health. And after all, population data sets rich in social determinants likely would allow people on the front lines to make more and better data-driven decisions. Great, thank you, George. Now this seems like a lot of information, maybe too much information? It, just where does social determinants of health information come from? Well, it, as it turns out, and as we've discovered, there, there's literally a, a treasure trove of very useful information around um, social determinants, and it's literally available to anyone who, who wants it. Yes, so as we're all probably aware, the 2020 decennial census is now underway, and the Census Bureau is counting every person in the country. But in addition to the decennial census, the Census Bureau also collects many useful information, such as the American Community Survey or the ACS. This is designed to update the demographic and social factors of the population more often than, than the decennial census and every location in the U.S. is updated at least once every five years. So among the data that's um, collected are uh, information on demographics, as you would expect, uh, age, gender, race, and ethnic ethnicity, all updated from the uh, decennial uh, census just on a more regular basis. But also there are social determinants factors you know, such as uh, housing, employment, income, uh, access to education, uh, access to transportation, and much more. And these are really at the heart of uh, social determinants. And there's also a wide range of options for uh, geographies. And they range from individual census blocks of just a few thousand people up through census tracts, zip codes, counties, and, and then larger metropolitan and rural statistical areas that are defined by the, the Census Bureau. 
And that allows you to estimate the social characteristics of populations at various levels of granularity, right down to what essentially is a, a neighborhood at the census block level. Now, among the advantages of using the Census Bureau information, specifically the American Community Survey, are that it's very well organized and highly curated. Uh, it's conveniently available online. And then what's a, an extra bonus is that it's, uh, it's absolutely free for, for, for the taking. And I think the Census Bureau, from our experience, even makes it really convenient to identify and download exactly the, the data that you need. In fact, like giving a plug for the, the Census Bureau. So this is the, uh, the American uh, Community Surveys website. And as you go through here, if you're not already familiar with it, um, start with the, the data section. And then from data, um, you can go down to data tables and tools. And you get a sense over on the right-hand side of the types of of information, so you can see the social determinants uh, down towards the, the bottom. Uh, and the online tools for producing data sets are, are very flexible. You can literally combine the, uh, the statistics that you need, the various measures, uh, with the ge uh, geographies that are most important from census block all the way up to statistical areas. Now, the other thing that the Census Bureau has done, because there's such a wealth of information is that they've done a great job on outreach and knowledge transfer. So if you go to the uh, Census, Census Academy website, uh, just Google that to get to it, uh, you'll see just a, a wealth of information on a variety of different subjects, including the American uh, Community Survey. Uh, and there's also something that they refer to as data gems. This is a set of uh, YouTube videos that provide information on a, a variety of different topics, and they help you uh, help introduce you to various things that you can do with this data, as well as uh, provide specifics on how to do it once you get a better, better understanding. So great resources freely available from the Census Bureau. Thanks, George. So Marissa, how do you make sense of all this data at a practical level? Yes, well, the good news is that the, the ACS provides a comp a, compre a comprehensive view of information around social determinants. However, the challenge is that it's almost too much information to comprehend and to put to good use. It can be overwhelming. How would we even start to organize this information? Well, fortunately, there's been a lot of work that's already been done to help distill the information down to something that's really useful. And in our research, we've discovered the, the concept of the social deprivation index. It combines a set of social determinants factors into a single number, that's, that's the index, which provides a useful starting point for analyzing the social characteristics of a population. Yes, so several countries around the world are already using SDIs to help manage the health of their population, including the United Kingdom and New Zealand. New Zealand is using the SDI metric to determine resource allocation and to explore variations in health outcomes among their populations. And we also discovered a variant of the uh, social deprivation index that was created specifically for the US using social determinants information from the American Community Survey's five-year estimates. The Robert Graham Center, which is a uh, health-focused think tank uh, based in Washington, DC, did the research analysis and data science to determine which of these social determinants factors had the highest correlation with health outcomes. Yes, so they selected seven factors and combined them into a social deprivation index, weighing them according to their influence on outcomes. The Graham Center's website provides data sets with both the SDI and the contributing factors for several census geographies, such as census tracts, zip code, county, and primary care service areas. Now, the information on the, the website is very, very useful. So there's a few different things that you can get out of this. Um, one is they provide the methodology for how they've determined this particular uh, social deprivation index. So most of the, the information, at least at a high level, is right on this, this first page. Uh, the, 
the files that give you the computed social deprivation index and the component parts of it are available for download right here on the site for the various levels of, of ge geographies that Marissa just, just mentioned. So you can literally download these. Now, you will see that these are a little bit dated. They use the 2015 uh, ACS data. But the information is there to compute the, uh, the social deprivation index yourself from more recently available ACS data. Now, if you're interested in this topic, the other thing you'll want to do is take a look at the references down, down below. Because the Graham Center has really built on the research that was done um, and described in these research papers right here, primarily the, the first one. Um, they've taken it to the next step, but most of the, the work and the research was, uh, was done by these folks right here. So uh, great resources, a good thing to know about if you're involved with population health and interested in social determinants. You know, this, is, this is a go-to resource for you. Great. Now, this data seems like it would be pretty useful for a variety of purposes, but how accessible is it to the people who are in the best position to really take advantage of it? who are likely not statisticians. Right. Not everyone's a statistician, for, for sure. But the whole point is to make the information accessible to as many people who can use it to make better uh, data-driven decisions. So the, the social deprivation index does help to distill the data down to something that more people can comprehend. But there's still the issue of how to present it most effectively. After all, not everybody can make sense of the of a table of, of numbers, for example. Yes. So one approach that we found to be effective is using maps to visualize the information. So if we summarize the SDI data for the entire U.S. at the state level by quintiles, we, we can see some interesting patterns. But they are very general and probably not that useful or actionable. But if we bring it down to the county level, and focus on a region like the Northeast, then we can see some more specific patterns emerge, emerge that identify areas with higher social deprivation. But these are still fairly general trends, right? We see a little bit more variation than we saw at the, at the state level. And you know, that, can be, that can be misleading. But if we take this down to the next level, and we're going to focus on Massachusetts, uh, we happen to be uh, in Massachusetts, in the Boston area, uh, we'll go through an example that uses our local geography. So we can see some patterns in Massachusetts at the, the county level. But if we bring, it, bring things down to the zip code level, we're going to see some very different patterns emerge. And there aren't a lot of surprises here. We, we would expect higher levels of social deprivation around the urban areas, like, uh, for example, Boston and Worcester and uh, Lowell, some of the other uh, communities, urban communities around, uh, around the, the, Boston, the Boston area. And in fact, if we go a little bit further into the neighborhoods and the communities that are part of the city of, of Boston, uh, we can actually see some very clear patterns of high social deprivation, whereas we go uh, to the, uh, the outlying communities and further out into the suburbs, the levels of social deprivation are much, much lower. I should point out that the, the darker color, the red, um, stands for the higher levels of social deprivation, and green would be lower, uh, lower levels of social deprivation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Marissa, how could we combine these estimates with information about actual people, and then what could we do with that? Right, so the SDI data is just an approximation of the social circumstances of a population. But we can fold this into information on specific individuals to give us more useful and actionable data. So here's an example. We can use individual level data to identify the incidence of diabetes as a proxy for health outcomes, since diabetes is quite prevalent. Visually, we can do the same thing as we did with SDI. Now, at the zip code level, there are clear pockets of high diabetes incidence as measured by the number of people diagnosed with diabetes per 1,000 of the population. And as we can see, this map is pretty heterogeneous. 
zoom a, l a little bit closer. And th those patterns are somewhat different than the patterns around the social deprivation index that we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, there are areas of, with high diabetes incidence that are in pretty good shape from the perspective of social deprivation. But let's say that we wanted to focus on segments of the population with both high diabetes incidence and high social deprivation. Because there may be things that we can do to mitigate some of the social challenges, such as providing access to transportation, so that people can get more ready access to, to doctors, uh, nutrition counseling, community exercise programs. So what we could do is visualize this, again using our maps, by overlaying the social determinants information with diabetes incidence. And again, we'll do this at the zip code level. And now, if we move in to that same level of granularity in the, the Boston area, you can see that some of these neighborhoods uh, directly south of Boston, which were all red in terms of social deprivation, we've identified some pockets that have that combination of very high social deprivation and a high uh, diabetes incidence. Now, this information, the information on the health outcomes using our diabetes proxy uh, are derived from patient level information, as Marissa pointed out. So they could come from electronic health records or health information exchange. And because of that, we're able to go down to the next level of detail and look at the, uh, the individual patients who comprise this cohort. So you know, we've got 2,400 uh, patients uh, that we have a record of. For the zip code that we chose, these are the social determinant characteristics. Uh, they're based on a percentile, so the higher the number, um, the higher the social deprivation. We've got our highest quintile for social deprivation, our highest diabetes incidence quintile. And then here are the individual people who make up um, the population of that zip code, at least the ones that we have visibility into. So we may want to do things like filter this list down to individual people who have exhibited signs of uh, exposure to uh, diabetes, um, such as prediabetes or maybe uh, hypertension. So this provides us with you know, the ability to, to generate a working list of people who might benefit most from our, our intervention strategy. Thanks, George. Marissa, what are some of the other potential uses and impacts of this data? Right. So right now, we're, we're just scratching the surface on, on what we can do with clinical data. There are lots of conditions and comorbidities, such as asthma or heart disease, that could be added to this approach to gain a deeper perspective on health outcomes. We can also monitor this data over time to objectively monitor whether our efforts are bearing fruit in terms of helping the people who need it the most. So there's some other interesting things that we can do with this data. So since it's highly quantitative, uh, it's actually great provides great opportunities uh, to feed the information into advanced analytics, such as uh, machine learning algorithms, which will help us to discover things that we might not otherwise stumble, stumble over on, on our own using maybe traditional ad hoc forms of, of analysis. Some examples. You know, like which of the social deprivation factors are most highly correlated with various health outcomes. And you know, we use the example of diabetes, but um, there are lots of other uh, ways to measure health outcomes. And you saw some of the variety of social determinants, not just the social deprivation index, but the factors that, that make that up. We can also segment out the population and look at the patterns within these, uh, uh, these subsets, and we tend to see different different patterns. And this is one of the areas where machine learning and artificial intelligence can help out because uh, they, can, they can look through those patterns and uh, come up with uh, clusters and classifications that we might otherwise miss. So in summary, social determinants information presents really a, a new frontier of opportunity for improving population health. And I think we're really just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of what the possibilities are. Uh, taking advantage of it is easier than you might have, have thought, and hopefully our discussion today has exposed uh, some of the possibilities. 
And the information is reliable, well organized, easily accessible. And in the case of uh, information from the Census Bureau, like the American Community Survey, it, it's even free. Now, this the Census Bureau data is certainly not the only source of information on social determinants. There are a variety of different sources, many of them available from commercial sources. But particularly if you're just starting out, uh, the American Community Survey is is a very effective starting point to kind of wrap your your arms around what's possible, and it's certainly cost effective to to get in the game. And with this data, you know, as you saw, you gain visibility into the opportunities to improve health that you that you otherwise might miss, and you can more confidently measure the impact of your efforts, such as intervention programs. Great, thank you, George and Marissa. We are going to open it up now to some audience questions. If you have questions, uh, there's a little box on the side of your GoToWebinar where you can type in your question. Um, our first question is, can you tell me more about how you integrated patient data with social determinants? Right, so this was basically a, a two-step process. So uh, one thing that we, we didn't mention was that the Census Bureau provides a geocoding software. Now, we use um, the, sense of the zip code level of um, geographic granularity, so we map our patients directly in the zip codes. But uh, if you wanted to take that down to the block level, you could use the geocoding software, which translates addresses down into very granular um, census, census regions, including block. So that's going to give us the uh, social determinants information kind of at a regional level. And the more specific the region, you know, the better the estimate it's going to be of social determinants. For the outcomes, we're taking information from health records. So for diabetes, uh, we had designations of di diagnosed di diabetes, which could come from claims information or from um, clinical um, conditions. Um, and that could be expanded for other outcomes as, as well. So the diabetes incidence data was uh, rolled up to our regional levels, our zip code level, and then uh, we have at the uh, at the zip code level we have our social determinants information, and we we combine at the area level. So we've got um, clinical information, outcomes information at the patient level. Uh, we integrated those two together uh, using the dimensional insight software. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, this is using an analytics platform that has the ability to uh, integrate data from uh, from various sources. Next question, where did you get the data for patients with high diabetes? Right, so th this is actually a demonstration uh, data set that uh, that we have. Um, and this was uh, this was actually based on a simulated population from the uh, Cynthia uh, project, um, which is a project put together um, uh, by MITRE. So it might not be absolutely precise, but the idea was to demonstrate the uh, the idea be, um, behind this. Um, we're doing this for real. We work with patients' electronic health record systems. The information would come uh, directly from electronic health records, and again, we would use uh, coded diagnosis information or uh, clinical coded data such as uh, SNOMED. Next question, how might we extrapolate a community view of low health literacy from what you have already shared? Low health literacy, that's, that's, that's a good one. Um, there's probably an approach there uh, similar to the social deprivation index where um, using possibly some of the factors such as um, education and income uh, might be indicators, but those would need to be matched up against you know, some type of outcome variable. But I think if you look into uh, some of the other variables that are available in the American Community Survey, uh, there, there may be opportunities to use something there. Uh, but again, you have to go into the community and uh, determine an, an outcome to, to compare that with. Next question, can social determinants of health information be factored into the MDM for a patient when determining overall risk for higher levels of EM services? Ooh. <laughs> I think you have me on that one. Uh, 
I'm not sure I can provide an answer because I don't know what the MBM is. So if whoever asked the question could, uh, could uh, provide some more insight into that, we might be able to, to work with that one. Next, what is best practice for clinicians to collect social determinants of health from patients in the clinical setting? Right. Um, I saw some uh, interesting presentations at a, uh, a conference that I attended a few months back, and some of the hospitals in the Boston area are beginning to do uh, social determinants um, screening. Boston Children's Hospital gave a presentation on uh, social determinants that they were beginning to screen for in um, with their uh, younger population, and they were things like uh, uh, challenges in their uh, in their social environment, uh, housing challenges, exposure to uh, health risks within within the home, and I think one of the things they found was that you know there there weren't necessarily uh, options for coding the data in a formal sense, but you know they were coming up with their own approaches to uh, to how to capture that data. Uh, but you know it struck me as an kind of an early example of how you can begin to do screening maybe in the absence of, uh, of the formal coding that will eventually be in place. So, previous question, uh, MDM is medical decision making. Can uh, social determinants of health information be factored into the medical decision making for a patient got determining it. overall risk? Yeah, and, and I think that comes, well, a couple of different answers to that. You know, certainly if you know where the patient um, is from and can characterize that area in terms of uh, having issues with uh, housing, for example, uh, one of the social determinants factors that's used in the Robert Graham uh, SDI was around crowding and housing. So, you know, if you know that your um, patient is in a crowded environment, there might be a, a set of uh, questions or you know, potentially interventions, social interventions that would help with, with that. But again, you know, that's using higher level data to kind of estimate where, um, what the issues are around a particular person. Um, as screening becomes, I think, more common, there will be opportunities to incorporate you know, more precise social determinants data uh, that's included in a patient's electronic record uh, to make medical decisions. Other than the SDI, any other useful ways to aggregate the data in a form that is digestible? Yeah, and this is the question that uh, we were trying to answer for ourselves because we were initially pleased that the information that was available in the American Community Survey, but then a bit overwhelmed in terms of where where do you start. So the the social deprivation index was the way to kind of net that down. Now that is certainly not the only answer. Uh, I think you know if you look at the research and you know even follow um, the Graham Center approach or the approach endorsed by the Graham Center, you could use um, the social determinants to uh, look for correlations with other with other outcomes. You know, they had chosen a specific set of outcomes, but the raw data is there to create indexes other than the, the social deprivation index, depending on what it is you're trying to measure. Now, George, do you know if there are any differences between this work and the CDC social vulnerability index? Right. Good. Good point. The social, the CDC's social vulnerability index is another um, social deprivation index, and that is certainly available. We only had time to talk about one, and we were intrigued by the uh, the Graham Center's social deprivation index. But um, there is work going on at the the CDC as well. Um, I can't claim that I know as much about um, uh, the CDC work um, as the the Graham Center. But if you're interested in this, you know, certainly certainly go to the CDC website. Great. Uh, well, George, before we wrap up, uh, why don't you take a minute or two and tell us a little bit about Dimensional Insight? Okay. Well, thanks, Kathy. So um, this was intended to be a uh, knowledge transfer opportunity, particularly for those of you who didn't get a chance to go to HIMSS. We didn't either, and we're disappointed by that. So we approached this from the uh, 
uh, perspective of education, but this is the commercial. So well, why are we talking to you about um, population health and social uh, deprivation? So we are, Dimensional Insight is an analytics um, software technology company, and one of our philosophies and focuses is to, uh, to, is to take complex problems like the ones that we've been talking about and, and simplify them with our, with our technology. In a lot of cases, uh, it's a simple solution that can get you uh, a fair ways down the, the road. Uh, and we provide everything in that analytics platform that you need to develop a fairly comprehensive decision support and enterprise class uh, decision support applications. Uh, and the effect, effectiveness of our technology has been borne out by the outcomes that our customers uh, have been able to produce for the seven-time winner for the uh, best-in-class award that's been uh, given for business intelligence and analytics in healthcare by, uh, by class research. And we provide a family of healthcare-specific applications uh, that run with our analytics platform technology, and they're designed to accelerate time to value by providing you with a head start, uh, getting meaningful data to the front lines of decision-making. Uh, the goal is all about uh, better data-driven decisions and more of them. And we've also been in the healthcare realm, specifically information technology and analytics for about 20 years in healthcare. So we have considerable experience that guide you towards successful outcomes. And um, we're, we're a good partner if you want to innovate quickly. Uh, we've been able to work with uh, many of our customers to bring them to the next level of uh, innovation as it relates to data management and analytics. Great, thank you, George. And so, if you're help, if you're looking for help on how to get started with population analytics or healthcare data management and analytics in general, you can visit our website. You can see it listed here: www.healthcare.dimmons.com. You can click on the request demo button. You can also send an email to info@dimmons.com. You can call us. Um, or you can also enter your email address in the survey that we are going to show at the end of this webinar. We have a couple of last logistical items to take care of before our webinar wraps up. First, like I said, we do have a short survey for you. We'd appreciate having you fill it out. It'll take just a few short seconds and that will pop up when you log out of the webinar. Next, we are going to draw our raffle winner for a $250 gift card. And our lucky winner is Jennifer Gino. Jennifer, we will be in touch with you after the webinar is over. Congratulations, Jennifer. We hope you learned a lot about population analytics and social determinants of health. Thank you all so much for joining us today.